Good morning, everybody. It's good to be here this morning. I'm thankful for this opportunity and the blessed privilege of being in the house of the Lord today. I'm thankful to today in comparison to the last few days I'm able to talk. Now, whether you're thankful for that remains to be seen. But I've enjoyed this meeting very much so far, and, and I love the idea of fellowship meetings, how important fellowship is to us. I was thinking at one point yesterday that as I could think about the congregation, and there were a few people here that was members of the church that I tried to pastor at one time in Andrews. There were people here that <clears throat> members of the church at Littlefield where I tried to pastor. Uh, we had members here from the church that I tried to pastor at Level End. This morning there's a few here from the church I try to pastor at Brownfield, and I realized how thankful I was as a minister to see the flock that I try to tend to meet together in peace and fellowship and worship and serve the Lord. Now, whether you realize it or not, your pastor has that great concern for you. He's concerned. He wants you to serve the Lord and follow the Lord. And when you don't, he hurts, hurts severely. And when you're following the Lord, you can't make him any happier. In fact, I heard the best way to get rid of a pastor you don't like is to do everything he says, and he'll be so excited he'll die of a heart attack. Well, but as I was thinking about this idea that how happy that I was as an under-shepherd about seeing the Lord's people together worshiping, serving our gracious God, how happy the chief shepherd must be. And that's why we're here this morning, is to worship and serve the chief shepherd. So thankful for the prayer that's been offered and publicly and those privately. <clears throat> This morning, if the Lord would bless us, I would like to begin over in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. I remember when I first began to pay attention to what the preacher was saying, I heard a number of preachers make the statement that we were accused of those that disagreed with us that old Baptists can't preach without the book of Romans. Well, yes, we can, but why would you want to? You know, if you were to go out into your garden and pick a bouquet of flowers and you had in your garden roses and, and you know, these irises and tulips and lilies and all these beautiful flowers, why would you bypass them and go pick one of those yellow flowers from a dandelion plant? You know, why skip something so beautiful? Now, the real problem people have with the book of Romans is not because we preach in it so often, is because they have a hard time defending their doctrine against the book of Romans. You know, if you can't defend your doctrine, you, you, you attack those who are preaching it. Well, the book of Romans is wonderful. And in Romans chapter 8, and such beautiful doctrines are laid out here in this 8th chapter, and the particular verse that I want us to think about this morning is verse 24. Romans 8 and 24 says, For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Now, unless you're a little bit slow, you know my subject this morning is the subject of hope. I would like for us for a little while to focus in on this hope that Paul mentions here in this letter. What is this hope that he's talking about? <clears throat> now, I have talked to some people and I have heard the reports of others that have talked to people of different religions and, and you've come to find out that primitive Baptists talk about hope a lot more than any other church does. 
And sometimes when we talk about the hope of heaven that we have, people will just kind of scoff at that and say, all you have is hope. I have a firm assurance that I'm going to heaven. Well, they don't have a good idea what the hope of the scripture is. And that's what I want us to think about here for a little while this morning. Now, the first thing we need to notice about hope, <clears throat> hope, if you notice how it's used here in this context, hope is looking toward the future. Hope is something that is concerned with where you're at right now and the direction that you're looking at. You're looking at something in the future. If I was to make the statement to you that I, I could say, I hope that it rains tomorrow, I'd probably get some amens. Now, what if I had, instead of making that statement, that I made this statement, I hope that it rained yesterday? Now, that kind of sounds kind of stupid, doesn't it? Uh, hope for something that yesterday? You see, hope is for the future, isn't it? Hope is looking for the future. Now, when we talk about the hope that we have, and if the Lord blesses us, what I want to show you is the hope that we have is better than the assurance that other people have. Now, so hope is here in the present looking for the future. Hope is not in opposition to knowledge. It's not, some people think that this knowledge of, of the future and knowledge of, of our eternal destiny is an opposition to hope. Hope is not in opposition to knowledge. You know, we can read over in, uh, in 1 John, <clears throat> 1 John chapter um, 3 and verse 14. It says, we know, we know we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Now, I'm not going to turn to it, but if you go back to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, you'll see that love is a fruit of the Spirit. And why does it call the fruit of the Spirit? Because if you have the Spirit, you're bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit. And one of those fruits is love. So the context here is saying, that if you have love to the brethren, it's an evidence that you do have the Spirit within you. Now, y'all know what real love is, don't you? Uh, when we say we love something, uh, I hope we're using it in the right context. You know, uh, I know some people that say, and I used to say this, I love football. You know, I got over that, thankfully. And, uh, you know, when the Bible's using the term love, uh, it's not used that way. Love is a commitment. Love is when you want something good to happen to somebody. When I say I love my bride, I'm wanting good things for her. I'm wanting happiness for her. I'm wanting joy for her, even if it's at my expense. And if we say we love the brethren and we mean it, that's what it's talking about. If you're in that state, you have evidence that you have passed from death unto life. And you can look in the scriptures here, and you can see that these people that preached about hope, in fact, where we were over in Romans chapter 8, as Paul was writing the book of Romans there under inspiration of God, <clears throat> the apostle Paul used that term hope. Many other of the writers in the New Testament use the term hope. But if you think about Paul using that term hope, you know, Paul was a, um, well, let me describe Paul this way. We've got some friends, and, and the wife told my bride one time that said that one of the things that attracted her to her husband was that he didn't have any hang-ups with self-esteem. Now, that was a way of saying that he was pretty arrogant. Well, you know, the apostle Paul was kind of like that. Paul had a little bit of a pride issue with him. And maybe justifiably so. You know, Paul talked about he was a Jew of the Jews. You know, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You know, he had more knowledge than all the people that he, you know, learned at the, at the schools of theology with. He had more zeal than all of them. That sounds kind of like he's bragging, doesn't it? 
Paul had all of this knowledge. He preached with boldness. He preached with all this strength of that great knowledge and, and knowing about God, but he talked about hope. Now, why did he talk about hope? Because he said saw hope was something in opposition, excuse me, hope was in something that was in full agreement with knowledge. Well, hope, if it's in agreement with knowledge, what is hope in opposition to? You know what hope is in opposition to? And this is where it begins to be important to us in our life today. Hope is extremely important to us because it's an opposition to despair. Let me give you an example. Go back to the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, Cain had just slain Abel, the first murder in the history of the world. And as the Lord came unto Cain, here in chapter 4 and verse 9, and he asked Cain that question, you know, where is Abel thy brother? Cain said, uh, I know not, and my, my brother's keeper. Now, not only was he a murderer, he was a liar, wasn't he? <clears throat> and the Lord put a curse on Cain. Now, you remember Cain was a farmer, tiller of the soil. And the Lord cursed him and said, it's not going to bring forth fruit for you anymore. He said, you're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. And here's what Cain's response was. Here in verse 13, Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. Now that sounds kind of desperate, doesn't it? That's you know, kind of ridiculous too. You know, it just hit me last night when I was thinking about this verse, how that Cain had stated this. You know, how many times can you be killed? Just once. You know, if he would have said, you know, every man that sees me is going to slap me on the face, I could have understood that. You know, that could have happened a thousand times, couldn't it? But he said, everyone that finds me is going to kill me. Well, it only happened once. But he was so full of despair. Did he have any hope of surviving? None at all. Now, by the way, uh, how did he know that everyone on the earth wanted to kill him? I mean, until his act against his brother, there had never been a murder. He was the first one. You might say he's the one that invented it. Well, it shows the depravity of his heart. It shows that the depravity and the hatred in his heart as he killed his own brother, he knew he had that same thought to others and figured they had it, assumed they had it for him also. You know, that's the problem with a lot of, of people that are uh, honest or crooked either one. They make this assumption that everybody else is just like them. Now, here's Cain. Here he's got this judgment pronounced. And he sees nothing but despair. Nothing but death is staring him in front. And if you think of it in this analogy, as Cain is looking into the future and he's looking down the tunnel and he sees a light at the end of the tunnel, you know what he says that light is? It's a train that's going to run over him. He has no hope for the future. So hope is an opposition to despair. So when the New Testament writers use this term hope, what they want us to understand is we are not to despair. We have something good. 
to look forward to. I remember the words that Paul wrote <clears throat> to the church at Colossae. Over in Colossians chapter 1 and down about verse 26, when Paul is talking about that he had had that call to preach the gospel, and he says, the part of that, he says, even the mystery, this is verse 26, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Verse 27 says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory. I don't know what this is yet, but it sounds good, doesn't it? The riches of the glory of this mystery. What is this mystery, Paul? The glory of the, the riches of the glory of this mystery to the Gentiles, which is, here it is. Here's the mystery that he's talking about. Christ in you. Now, what, is, what does that mean? Christ in you. What does that give us? Paul tells us, verse 27, the hope. Of glory. As was mentioned yesterday in one of the messages, this life that we live in is difficult from time to time, isn't it? This life is rough. And to quote one, uh, I don't want to say he's an expert, but he said something that was pretty good. And he was only, you know, eight or nine years old when he said it friend of a friend, but the statement was, life's tough, then you die. Well, sometimes it seems that way, doesn't it? Life is difficulty. And as we mentioned yesterday, we've all been touched in some way or another. Some of us have went through health issues. Some of us have had difficult times and Maybe it was a, a painful separation from a loved one with a divorce or something like that. Some have lost husbands and wives and children and to death and other horrible things. Some have suffered great financial setback. Some, it may be an emotional difficulty. What, you know, we've all had different things in our families and in ourselves. We've all suffered in this life. But what the Lord wants us to know, there's something better coming. We have a hope. We are not to despair of the future. We have a great hope. Over in Hebrews chapter 6, Paul brings it out this way in this particular account. He had set up in, in uh, verse 13, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Here's something important. Drop down to verse 17. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, two immutable things, two things that can't change, in which it was impossible for God to lie. So here's the two immutable things. Here's the two things that can't change. God makes a promise and he'll stand by it. He cannot lie. And his will will not change. He cannot love you today and hate you tomorrow. That will not change. His counsel will not change. So two immutable things that he has brought together. Here, that his power and his, his desire and his impossibility to lie. He said, by these two things that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge. We all need a refuge, don't we? Everybody has a refuge of some type. have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope, lay upon the hope that is set before us. Which hope? What does this hope do for us? Which hope we have 
as an anchor of the soul. Now, if you think of the analogy of, of being out in the middle of the ocean and the waves are severe and, and things are looking very difficult and, <clears throat> and it's easy if you're in a boat to, to go this way and that way and up and down and all these different ways. <clears throat> Life is like that, isn't it? It's easy to be thrown about. You know, we're all a little bit different on this. <clears throat> you know, I've known some people that, you know, their emotional line was like this, and you could tell them they won a million dollars to be, okay. You know, your best friend died, okay. You know, other people, you could tell them, you know, uh, you just won a dollar in the cereal box, and I mean their emotional level would go way up. You know, we all have different emotions, wouldn't it? But we do have an anchor in this world to keep us steady on the even keel spiritually. What is that anchor? Hope. Hope is an anchor. Hope is an anchor in this world. As we live, and this hope that we have is not for the future. I mean, we're looking for the future. But you remember over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when Paul was writing there that great chapter on love and charity, and he ended that chapter by saying, now, Abide of faith, hope, and charity, but the greatest of these is charity. What happened to hope and faith? I mean, how come they're not going to abide forever? Because hope isn't for the future. When we're in heaven, are we going to need and hope for heaven anymore? No, we're going to be there. We'll still have that charity. Hope is something that gets us through this now, this hope that we have, this anchor of the soul that's here so that we might not despair, this hope is here so that we'll keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ. That's what this hope is for, to be focused on Jesus Christ. This hope is to get it through, get us through this world. <clears throat> number of years ago when shortly after I was ordained to the ministry and I moved to <clears throat> Andrews and tried to pastor the church down there and from time to time I worked for Brother Rex Johnson at the funeral home and I got to meet a lot of families that went through a lot of different difficulties. <coughs> Some of those families <clears throat> you can imagine there's husband or wife or child had died in an accident or by horrible disease. I was one time involved in a service of a six-year-old boy that had been afflicted from his youth. All of these things are difficult. And I began to pay attention to the people in those families. And it began to come easy to spot the people that had hope. There were some of those people there that I describe as wailing and gnashing of teeth. They had no hope. You and I, friends, have a hope. We have a hope because there's a promise of God by a God that cannot lie. This world may be difficult. but there's something better coming. It's hope what gets us through. You know, that assurance that some people have that they're going to heaven because they made some little decision, they recited some little prayer, they did some little ritual or formality at some uh, institution of this world, their little thing that they did to get them to heaven doesn't help them a bit today. What we have today in hope helps a bunch, doesn't it? Because, see, our hope is built on Jesus Christ. Now, what does this hope do for us? Well, let me look at just a couple of things. I wanted to uh, hear in just a few minutes get out of Elder Watson's way and let him preach to us. But there's some effects of this hope. Over in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 3, 
John says, every man that hath this hope, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. Do you have that hope in you this morning? Do you have that hope that when you breathe your last here on this earth, close your eyes here in death, you're going to wake up in the presence of Jesus Christ? Do you have that hope this morning? If you have that hope, you know what John is saying? John is saying you're purifying yourself. Now, what is he saying? He says we can make ourselves pure and holy and, and uh, righteous without stain of sin. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying if you have this hope, what your desire is going to be is to purify yourself before God. These people who hear salvation by grace and hear that salvation is all of God, that our eternal salvation is fixed. Jesus Christ has paid the price in full. It's taken care of. <clears throat> we don't have to do anything. We've, we've been made accepted in the beloved. We're heaven bound. People oftentimes hear that and say, if I believe that, I'd go out and sin all I wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Because if you believe that like I do and like you do, you're already sinning more than you want. I have a desire to purify myself every day. Now, y'all may not believe me when I say this, but I'm not a pure saint. I was really hoping y'all wouldn't laugh. <laughs> now, now I expected it. But ever not, even in my best days, ever not when I go to bed, I cry to the Lord, forgive me of my sins. I thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We have a desire as God's children to serve him. Why? Because of that hope. I have a hope that I'm going to see him again. I'm going to see my Savior. I have that great hope that when I see my Savior, he'll look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I have that great hope. I think sometimes I've messed, already messed up way too far to get to that point. But I have that hope of being before my Savior. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, Peter tells us, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be always ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of that hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I believe we ought to tell people what God has done for us. Now, I don't, it says meekness and fear. I, I don't think that includes standing on a, a soapbox at a, at a highway intersection and calling everybody a sinner that walks by. I don't think that's how it's done. I think meekness and fear rules that out. But I think what he's saying, people are going to notice the hope that we have. When they see our calm assurance, you know, 16, 17 years ago, I buried my father. And sure, there was sadness. But through it all, there was a firm assurance that I was going to see him again. And unless the Lord comes back soon, someday, I'll do it with my mother, do it with other people here, or maybe y'all do it with me. We don't know what the future holds. But there's a calm assurance. Why? We're going to see one another again. And people see that. People see how we can react to the things in life. And people see people like Job when they lose everything and 
can calmly say, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. And they'll ask us, how can you be so calm in all of these things? It's because I have a hope. Heaven's sitting out before me. Years ago, I had a discussion with a particular gentleman talking about a difficult thing at work and how extremely difficult it was going to be at this particular job for the next couple of months. And the statement, the man was, well, we can put up with anything for a little while. And that's true, isn't it? You know, I put up with a lot of things at a job for a little while that I wouldn't put up for very long. Well, in this world, we're putting up with a lot right now. How come we're willing to do that? Because of hope. We have a hope of something that's coming. Something great and wonderful is coming. And I want to close by going to the book of Titus, chapter 2, and verse 13. Here is Paul wrote this letter to this minister, this young minister, Titus. As he's beginning to close out this letter, he says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope in the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's what the end of our hope is, isn't it? You know, back to that analogy of a tunnel. And there's a light at the end of that tunnel. Those in despair, halfway down the tunnel, you see that light and you realize it's a train and you don't have time to get out of the tunnel and you realize death is imminent. You're in despair. The light at the end of the tunnel is a train. But for you and I, you know what hope tells us? Hope teaches us. Hope confirms to us. What hope confirms to us is yes, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's the glory of Jesus Christ. And he's coming back, and we're going to be with him. Let us rejoice.